Today we've got a really special treat for you. We're gonna build this retro arcade cabinet. Hit it! So my friend Brian Ibbett asked me if I could help him build an arcade cabinet. And he had all the internal stuff, the Raspberry Pi, it's actually Retro Pi, as well as the buttons, joysticks, LED lights, all that stuff. And he just needed help with the cabinetry. So we kind of collaborated, went back and forth to come up with a design that uses all the stuff that he had and came up with this. So it's a very retro gaming cabinet and uh, let me give you a little bit of a quick tour. This tabletop arcade is a gamer's dream come true and is built in a style that's equal parts retro and classy. It features a classic six button layout, as well as start and select buttons. There's also a USB port for onboarding of games, as well as plugging in keyboards and other game pads. The speakers include a volume control and custom 3D printed grills, and the custom marquee is backlit using LED strips. In the back, there's a service door. That power cord you see there will be turned into a switch later on. The inside is a bit of a mess, but the final organization hasn't been done yet. The system is powered by a tiny computer called Raspberry Pi, and we're using a great software package specifically for gaming called RetroPie. The only thing that sucked about this project was that I didn't build it for myself, but at least I'll get to play it at Brian's house. I'm using 3 quarter inch walnut plywood for my cabinet, but if you're painting yours, you can use just about anything you want. I use a drywall square to lay everything out ahead of time. I'll break down the sheet into strips. While these pieces might have relatively straight edges, they likely aren't parallel. We'll use the table saw for that. I set the fence to our final 22 inches and give our two strips a parallel trim. Now we need to cut our parts from the larger strips. Start by squaring up one end. From there, it's a simple matter of measuring, marking, and cutting. At the table saw, I trim all of the 22 inch parts to final width. There are several bevels in this project and I did my best to simplify them as much as possible. Follow the diagram closely and you should have no trouble. Take your time with these cuts and make sure you provide consistent pressure downward and against the fence. If you don't, the workpiece will lift and your bevel won't be consistent and flat. You'll also want to avoid stopping in the middle of the cut since that's likely going to create some nasty burn marks. Now let's work on the cutouts, starting with the back. I drill a relief hole at each corner just big enough for the jigsaw blade. Speaking of the blade, you'll want something with lots of teeth for a smooth cut in plywood. I stay just inside of my pencil lines so that I can do a final cleanup afterwards. Even with a good blade, jigsaw cuts are crappy at best, so I'm going to use a router to clean things up. I line up a clamping tool guide with the pencil line and clamp it in place. Now if I flip the piece over, I can use a bearing guided flush trim bit to make cleanup passes. Yeah, it's a lot of extra work, but it's totally worth it, especially when these edges will receive edge banding later. To clean up the corners, I start by cutting in with a flush trim saw, and then doing the final cleanup with a chisel. And be sure to hang on to that cutout piece because that's our door. Simply trim all four sides to clean them up and make sure you account for the fact that the door and the opening will receive eighth inch thick edge banding. The next cutout is for the screen. This one has to be precisely laid out based on the size of the monitor. Place the monitor on the screen board so that it's centered from left to right. The vertical position is up to you, but keep in mind that there's a marquee at the top and that'll consume some of that space. Once in position, trace around the perimeter of the monitor. Now we need to measure the monitor bezel and subtract an eighth of an inch for the edge banding. Transfer those measurements directly to the screen board. And do the cutout just like we did for the back panel. To hold the monitor in place, we'll use a simple plywood cleat that's held on with screws. I carefully measure the hole pattern and transfer the locations to the cleat. Check your screw length by screwing one in until it bottoms out and then back it up by about a quarter turn. If the screw head sits above the plywood, it's too long. And if it sits far below, it's too short. Since I'm too lazy to go buy different screws, these 25 millimeter long screws will work if I counter bore the hole. And now we can drill the through holes for the screws.
Drop the monitor in place on the screen board and measure for the supports that we'll have to attach at each end. We'll cut those supports from solid stock. They should slide perfectly right under the cleat. Pre-drill and countersink for two screws on each side and don't use any glue on this joint. And that's as far as we'll take the monitor for now. Now let's drill the holes for the control panel. I printed my templates from an Instructables plan, but you can use the ones that we provide. It's a good idea to put as much space as you can between the left and right button sets as this directly impacts how much elbow rubbing you'll do when you're playing with friends. Using a screw, I make a starter hole at each button location. The front button placement isn't critical, but I like things to line up, so I make sure mine start in line with the leftmost buttons on each side. The larger buttons on top of the control panel are 1 and an eighth inch diameter, and we'll use a Forstner bit at the drill press to do the work. The joystick holes are drilled with a 3 quarter inch bit. The buttons on the front of the control panel are a little bit smaller than the buttons on the top, so those are drilled at 1 inch. Now we also need an additional 3 quarter inch hole for the USB port on the front of the control board. This guy is pressure fit, so we don't want to push it in just yet. Now the marquee requires two grooves for the marquee panel. We can cut these at the table saw by taking a few passes. I'm making mine a quarter inch deep, but the width of the groove depends on how thick you go with the marquee material. Ours is about an eighth of an inch thick, plus I give it some extra room for the custom vinyl print that goes on top. Now for the speaker holes. We're using 2 inch speakers, so the holes are laid out and drilled with a 2 inch Forstner bit. For a hole this large, a hole saw might be a more economical choice if you don't have this bit laying around. These speakers have a little volume control that will install a few inches from the left speaker. We'll need to drill a 3 quarter inch hole a half inch deep on the underside of the bottom marquee board. Then we'll continue with a quarter inch hole all the way through. Now it's tricky to see, but the volume module inserts from the back and a small washer and nut is threaded on. Then the volume knob drops onto the post with a friction fit. Now let's dress up some of our edges with edge banding. I cut some walnut face frame stock into a few 25 inch long pieces. At the table saw, I'll rip them to about an eighth of an inch in width. I'm using a sacrificial gripper to do this because it's safe enough to push it all the way through the cut, but there are other methods you might explore. Check out the video I made on this very topic for more information. You'll need something like 25 of these strips to get the job done, though I don't recall the exact number. Applying edge banding isn't difficult, but it is time consuming. I cut the pieces to length as needed and apply glue to both faces. You don't need a ton of pressure for edge banding. One of my favorite tricks is to use pieces of blue tape like clamps. Just stretch the pieces over the banding and rub them onto the sides. If you have a brad nailer, you can save yourself some time, but you will create tiny holes that you might want to fill with putty later on. Here I'm using a 23 gauge pinner. That's very, very tiny pins and the holes are very small as well, so I might not have to fill those later on. I'll edge band the screen boards and the back at this point. I'll also band the back door. The banding material is just a bit wider than our plywood, so we can either use a scraper to flush it up or hit it with some 220 grit sandpaper. Keep in mind that you can easily burn through the veneer on plywood, and this process requires a very light touch. Gaps are inevitable, so if you see one, fill it with a little wood putty of the appropriate color. Using a small block of wood and some sandpaper, I sand the edge banding nice and smooth. Resist the urge to use a power sander here, as that's really just going to round over the edge and make it look like poo. Other pieces we can edge band now include the marquee top, the marquee bottom, and the case bottom. Now we hope to install a small power switch in the back. Unfortunately, after doing a little more research, we read reviews that mention fire hazards and melting. So we're currently looking into our options here and hopefully we'll find something that fits into this hole nicely. 
At the top of the screen board, we'll need two 3 quarter inch holes for wire runs. And now we can start to do some assembly. I'm using inch and a quarter brad nails to do the holding. First, we'll put together the control board front and top. There's no edge banding on the top piece yet, so we'll make the front piece flush with the edge of the top and pop some brad nails in to hold it together. The key to a successful joint here is to first apply as much pressure as you can with your hand or a clamp, and then drive the nail through. Once that joint is dry, attach the edge banding to the front. Next, we'll assemble the back and the marquee top, and here's a cool trick. Place the pieces flat with the tips of the bevels touching, and stretch some blue tape across the joint, almost like you're stitching it. Now flip the assembly over, and throw some glue on both sides of the joint. Slowly lift and bring the two pieces together. Next, we'll attach the bottom. We'll use glue and screws for this, but using some clamping squares really makes life a whole lot easier. We'll set that aside to dry completely, since we don't want to stress the joints just yet. Now let's attach the screen board to the lower marquee board. I pre-drill the hole locations using my marks as reference, and then flip it over and countersink from the other side. Now with the help of some clamping squares, I bring the lower marquee piece back in place with some glue on the edge. With clamping pressure applied, I could flip the assembly over and drive the screws. We can now attach the screen board to the monitor assembly. Everything should be flush on the outside edges. The vertical position should be obvious based on the screen bezel. Double check that everything is lined up from the front, although now would be a really sucky time to discover that it's not. Just for some extra support, I'm adding an extra walnut cleat under the monitor. I don't really think it's necessary, but it certainly can't hurt to help fight the forces of gravity. At least that's what my wife tells me. Once dry, take the monitor out by removing the screws, holding the cleat to the supports. Now here's a crucial step. We have three sub-assemblies that need to come together. In all likelihood, it won't be perfect. This is exactly why we haven't cut our sides to shape yet. In my case, when the top of the screen board is perpendicular to the top of the marquee, the marquee fronts are in alignment, and the control panel is perpendicular to the bottom of the case, my two bevels don't quite meet up in the middle. The pieces are just a bit too wide, so that they're pushing each other apart when they try to come together. And the only piece that we can safely trim at this point is the top of the control panel. So I'll tilt the blade on the table saw to match the existing bevel, and slowly sneak up on that perfect fit. Now look at how much better those pieces match up. Now I can confidently attach the control panel assembly to the screen panel. We'll use the tape trick on this joint too, only the pieces have to be vertical. At this point we'll apply some edge banding to any area that needs it, because we're actually ready to apply some finish. The next step is to begin installing the electronics, and we really don't want to worry about finishing around buttons and joysticks. The finish I'm using is a satin wiping polyurethane. The first coat is easy, flood it on, and wipe off the excess. I'll apply a total of four coats with some light sanding with 320 grit paper in between. Now for the electronics. This is Brian's baby, so he's running the show. We start by connecting the wires to the buttons, which provides signal and LED lighting. Once you have one set up properly, leave it out as a sample so you can easily match up the rest of them. Brian's also jazzing things up a bit by adding numbers and letters, as well as a dot and a star to the start and select buttons. He's using something called Letra Set Dry Transfer to burnish the figures into the buttons. You could probably just find a set of decals or stickers to do something similar. Just keep in mind that these buttons light up, so anything you put on the face could potentially block the light. Each button is then dropped into the desired hole, and the plastic nut is screwed in place. 
Brian realized after the project was complete that he actually would have preferred a different order and different letters. Instead of ABC123, he'd prefer LXRYBA, which is a more standard layout and naming convention. So choose your letters and positions wisely. After installing the smaller buttons, it becomes clear that they aren't really intended for 3 quarter inch thick material. By turning the nut around, you'll have enough room for the threads to grab, and that gets the job done. Each set of buttons then gets connected to its own circuit board. It actually doesn't matter which buttons go where, since the software will help you map them out later. While we're here, the pressure fit USB port is pushed into place. Now before we go any further, we're doing a test run. With the buttons connected to the USB hub and the hub connected to the Raspberry Pi, we'll fire it up. Because the buttons aren't set up yet, we'll use a USB gamepad to navigate the menu. Everything does seem to be working, so now we can continue with the installation. I'll attach the button circuit boards to the underside of the control panel by pre-drilling first and then driving four screws. The joystick installation is pretty simple, but it really helps to have two sets of hands and eyes. The stick needs to be perfectly centered in the hole, so as Brian makes the adjustments, I'll hold the stick in place, and he can then come around to my side and mark the screw locations. From there, we can attach the cable between the joystick and the circuit board. And now I'll make sure the joystick is dead center and then tighten up on the screws. Now for the speakers. Brian sacrificed a small set of USB powered speakers by tearing them out of their casing. Obviously, these parts were never meant to come out of their cases, so if you go this route, you have to be extra careful. With the screen panel clamped to the workbench, we can drop the speakers in place and attach them with screws. To attach the volume knob, we'll need to flip this thing upside down in order to thread the nut onto the shaft. We can then add the volume knob. Back inside the marquee, we'll use some plastic cable clips to secure the wires. Now we'll add some adhesive backed LED strips, and two rows should do the trick. And those lights work perfectly. We then had an unexpected visit from Quality Control. When it's ready, can I try it out? Yeah, of course. Oh, yeah. And now for the final assembly. I'll bring the monitor in and reattach it. Now we need to line up the front control panel up just behind the edge banding on the bottom, and the top lines up with a pencil line that you probably can't see from your vantage point. To attach the pieces together, we'll use screws and no glue. I'll drill a 3 8 inch hole, 3 8 of an inch deep, and then I'll drill an 8 inch pilot hole all the way into the adjoining piece. Now the screw head is driven deep enough that we can use a 3 8 inch dowel as a plug. Should we ever need to open this thing up, we can drill out the dowels and access the screws. All of the screws for the top and the bottom are done this way. And finally, we can work on the sides now that the main body of the cabinet is locked into its final shape. With the back panel flush against the back edge of the side panel, start tracing a line around the perimeter. Cutting out and shaping the sides is really just a rehash of techniques you've already seen. We'll rough cut with the jigsaw and then refine with the router. Though given the shape, you'll have to get creative using clamps and a straight piece of scrap as a guide. After rough cutting the other side to shape, we'll use the first one as a routing template to make two exact copies. Double stick tape holds them together, and since this is uh, pressure sensitive stuff, I like to put a little weight on it. And of course the flush trim bit does the rest of the work. On the inside corner, I take the time to miter the two pieces where they meet for a cleaner look. That's a really nice fit. Once all the edges are banded, we trim flush and sand smooth. Don't forget to ease the edges and round over the corners. 
To attach the sides, we'll use screws and dowel caps. To cover up the holes, I'll first cut down some 3 8 inch poplar dowel. If you don't like a contrasting look, make sure you use the same species that you have in your plywood. Normally, I'd use wood glue to attach these, but in this case, I want these dowels to come out if needed, so CA glue is a better choice. The bond should be easier to break if we have to. Once the glue is dry, flush trim the dowels and give them a little sanding. And finally, we can apply the finish to catch the sides up to the rest of the cabinet. Now we'll install the hinges for our door, starting with a self-centering drill bit. These are simple no mortise hinges that are super easy to install. I start by spacing them out to my liking on the door's edge with the barrel down and pushed against the door face. I'll pre-drill the two interior holes. Now I can attach the hinge to the door with the barrel up and it'll be in the perfect position. The other hinge is installed the same way. Now I hold the door in position and line it up by eye. I could then use a pencil to mark the holes for the top hinge. With the top hinge secure, locking down the bottom hinge is a breeze. The door needs some sort of a catch, so I'll install a simple one on a piece of scrap. The magnet goes into a small hole, and then I glue that piece to the inside of the door opening. On the door, I'll attach a small metal washer that'll engage with the magnet. Looks like that's going to work just fine. Now Brian has a 3D printer, and he used it to print up a cool custom knob for the back door. And with that, this arcade cabinet is complete. You might not have ever heard of it, but here it is! It's Thing Man. <laughs> There's still lots of programming to do, and Brian plans on tidying up the interior, but it works and works well. The marquee is nice and bright, the audio is clear and loud, and the action of the joysticks and buttons is smooth and satisfying. Oh, and don't forget to make sure you brush your kids' hair before putting them in a video. Special thanks to Brian Ibbett for collaborating with me on this project, and to our wives for tolerating us geeking out on it for a few weeks. Happy gaming, my friends.